Good afternoon. You're very welcome to UDR Declassified, one of a series of events to mark Bloody Sunday 49, the 49th anniversary of the Bloody Sunday Massacre. You can catch up on all the great events on social media if you follow hashtag Bloody Sunday 49. My name is Kieran McCarch and I am a researcher and project manager with a charity called Paper Trail Legacy Archive Research. And this is a great honour for me to host this particular discussion for a number of reasons. First and foremost, to commemorate the victims and survivors of Bloody Sunday, uh, they and their families who have waged a, a tireless campaign with such great dignity over the last 49 years are great heroes of mine, and they continue to be an inspiration to campaigning families across these two islands. Secondly, I get to interrogate the author of a new important work called UDR Declassified, Me Hall Smith, who is an advocacy worker with the Pat Finucane Centre and author also of The Impact of the Parachute Regiment in Belfast, 1971 to 73, which itself was another very important work. The Pat Finucane Centre is one of our leading human rights organisations who have supported families, including the families of the McGurk's Bar campaign. I'm one of those family members for many years. And they've been at the co-face of information, retrieval and truth recovery for many decades. Our families have not been able to rely on the police or the state to give us information or to find evidence for us, as it was usually them who buried it. So we have had to look to the PFC and its workers like Miho to help us and help us they have. The fruits of many, many years of hard slog, and I know how hard that slog is at archives, um, are recorded in this very important book, UDR Declassified, UDR is of course the Ulster Defence Regiment, a regiment of the British Army. Its author, Michal Smith, joins me. Michal, congratulations on this very impressive and important book. And thank you very much for giving me uh, one of the first sights of it. Um, it was a great honour. Could you tell us a little about yourself and how a lapsed diplomat came to be working on a book such as this? And why are you releasing it in 2021? Um, thanks, Kieran. Uh, it's a great honour to take part in this, uh, to be part of Bloody Sunday celebrations or commemorations. Um, lapsed diplomat, I, I think I prefer the term recovering diplomat. Um, uh, <laughs> I, <laughs> I had worked with uh, foreign affairs for years out of Dublin and uh, uh, it was through the work up here that I was doing that I, I you know, I, I came across the Pat Finucane Centre, got very interested in what they were doing and um, Life left me here and washed me up in Belfast and met a lovely woman and married her and have a family and um, the opportunity came to join the PFC and I, I left at it. So I've been with them three years, done some great work with some great people and uh, came to write this now, this, this time. And uh, I think it's important to say that I'm not the only person contributing to this. There's um, original work by all the staffers in the team. So um, I won't claim to be the sole author at all especially not if it goes wrong anyway, but um, um, it was intended to mark the 50th anniversary last year, <clears throat> but obviously got overtaken by events and life changed for a lot of people. And it got put on the back burner, I guess. Um, the 50th anniversary would have fallen on 1st of April, uh, 2020. Um, and as we, as we necessarily delayed, of course, but as we looked at it, the project got bigger and bigger. Um, and the reason is it's a large and significant part of our history. Um, for one tradition, I, I think you can say service in the UDR was a very noble act. Um, since its formation, it was on continuous operational service for a period of 22 years, a, a distinction held by no other regiment in the long history of the British Army. But for the Catholic community and the UDR often didn't differentiate between nationalist and republican. An encounter with the UDR was frequently hostile, uh, often brutal, and sometimes fatal. I think it's still relevant to look at these issues when you consider that last week, the NIO, Northern Ireland office, was consulting with um, loyalist extremist leadership um, to consult on, on British foreign policy. In 1974, they were consulting them on the future direction of the UDR uh, and the loyalist commanders, uh, they're minuted. I, and we have, we have the document 
um, made the demand to get full-time UDR battalions. And um, that demand was it was acceded to and led to the bizarre situation where loyalist extremists were dictating British military policy. Hmm. Um, so it's, it is, it's relevant still. <clears throat> the project kept growing, but we're ready to launch it now, I think. Um, I find, and it's a personal bugbear of mine, but I find that with many books on the conflict in the north of Ireland, and it's probably because we've read so many of them, but especially academic studies, but sometimes these b- books regurgitate and reference what has gone before. So whenever you pick up a new book, you go, well, there isn't really too much in there that we don't know already, that it already isn't in the public domain. There are already two sympathetic studies that have been written on the Ulster Defence Regiment by Mm -hmm. Potter and by Ryder. What makes yours different? Well, you're right. There's not a lot out there. There are some memoirs um, other than Potter's and Ryder's books, which which we've used in this, definitely. We use them as reference sources. Um, And some of the self-published memoirs have been useful from local commanders and stuff like that. But ours not regurgitate and certainly builds on existing work um, and Anne Wallader's Lethal Allies and um, Margaret Orwin's Estate in Denial mm. and her more recent Fermanagh from Plantation to Peace Process. They tell some of the story. Um, Lethal Allies, of course, would be the definitive account of collusion in the Glenan and mid Ulster murder triangle. Um, and that has been, it's a, it's a book that has been used as, as evidence in court. Um, the PSC in 2014 released a booklet called The Hidden History of the UDR, uh, which was a dig into the files. It discussed uh, collusion between the UDR and loyalist paramilitaries, the penetration of that regiment by loyalists, and the extent to which all of this was known about, tolerated, encouraged by the British establishment. Um, we've revisited that and updated it with further findings from the files. Um, and I think it's fair to say we've, we've found a lot more value more of value, excuse me, uh, in the years since. So 2014 to 2021, that's seven years more digging and uh, PSC and JFF staff, past and present, contributed to this. So it's it's a much more comprehensive look at the issues than has been there before. Um, We want to talk about the background to the UDR, its predecessors, the tradition it came from. We're trying to show it in context. I think it's very important always to, to set policy in, in an international context and look at it perhaps in the British colonial context, certainly. Um, we wanted to reflect the experience of those who served in the UDR uh, and to acknowledge their losses indeed. Um, but we also want to show the range of illegal, collusive and murderous acts of some of its number. And, uh, mm. and as ever, attempt to understand it in the context of British colonial military practice. I mean, you've touched on some of those key points for me there. Um, an important point that you also raise in the book, and you, you've touched upon it already, uh, speaking with you, is that and I had occasion to go back and check the numbers and to check how many people served during the UDR uh, and what have you. I mean, the vast majority, it should be noted, and you do note uh, that of UDR members weren't involved in criminality and were not members of extremist organisations. There were young men and women who... Uh, joined for a number of reasons, including protection of their local community, protection of their country. Um, And if you look at the likes of Lost Lives, even though that a figure of around about 200, 206 would be given for um, how many members of the UDR were killed during the conflict, there were many more then that were killed uh, who were former members of the Ulster Defence Regiment that were uh, allegedly uh, targeted because of that reason. But I, had, I went back and I double-checked the, 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 the correct rule of honour, which records uh, from British military sources, not necessarily the official version of how many people killed, but it has an increase of around about 40% on the total number of British armed force casualties during the conflict that were killed. And I, I looked at the numbers for the Ulster Defence Regiment, and there were nearly three times as many um, that aren't officially recognised as such because because they were not killed um, in uh, IRA attacks, for example. But this number amounted to around about 570 serving UDR um, that were killed through the likes of road traffic accidents, accidents with guns, um, uh, dare I say even suicide as well. But 
the key point is that these men and women would not have died, uh, regardless of the reasons, only for the conflict situation here. And I think it's 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 good within the book that you do recognise the the massive human toll, and even mm. researchers of of the conflict don't recognise even with the official figures how much of a human toll it actually took, and specifically then, of course, on one community, which we'll, we'll, we'll touch on why that was the case a wee bit later on. Now, there was many hundreds and thousands more that were badly injured as well, and then if you multiply that again by their family members that were gravely impacted by the conflict too, you're talking thousands upon thousands, mm. of around about 40,000 people that then served. But... And this is a big, but as the title of your book suggests, and uh, I mean, it's something that I'll be reminding people um, who, whenever they do pick it up themselves, this is a book about secret British archives. Yeah. This is about the UDR declassified from those archives. So this is very much a book about what the British state thought about the Ulster Defence Regiment. Yeah. What do the archives then tell us? Um. Well, before I get to the archives, just I want to do do want to acknowledge that that we we pay tribute to the people that that died in UDR service and numbers that died after. Um, we have to acknowledge that there was a great deal of suffering on all sides of the of, of our communities here, um, and it was very difficult actually to find any kind of um, what's the word. Um, consensus i guess on 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 the sheer volume of, of harm that was that was incurred by by udr people and their families um we wrote it we, we wrote a decent chapter on it i think and um, to reflect the losses to reflect the problems that people felt uh we wanted to reflect findings by uh udr um advocacy groups who looked at the ongoing legacy issues that they're still faced by that community and the difficult, difficulties they have in, in, in kind of accessing help and support. Uh, there's, a, there's a secrecy about having been in the UDR in many cases. Um, and I think it's very important to acknowledge that, that it, it's aside from the, from the British archives, but um, to get back to the British archives, I guess, um, some of, a lot of people will know this, that um, it was acceptable to welcome the UDA into the UDR. Uh, I think that we can agree that it was, its purpose was as a militia. That's the, the, the context we set it in, was the practice of having a colonial militia in Ireland and, and abroad indeed had, had always been there. Um, uh, back to the archives, however, um, as you say, this is a book about secret British archives and what the British state didn't want us to know at the time or indeed if they ever wanted us to know it. Um, we've learned uh, that the UDA was welcomed into the UDR. Um, it was, um, the UDA was seen as a safety valve, is, is what they called it for uh, loyalist, loyalist extremism. Um, and we set the context of the UDA infiltration of the UDR very much in the terms of, um, of a colonial militia. Uh, it was a plausibly deniable militia force that, that was that was run. Um, I'll share a document here that, that we had. Um, it's clear that the UDA attracts considerable sympathy for its political aims amongst some UDR soldiers. It's suspected that a minority of UDR soldiers are actually active members of the UDA. But an important consideration for UDR commanders is the maintenance of morale. Soldiers are therefore not to be forced into declaring a political allegiance now, nor are they to be punished simply for being members of the UDA. Um, here we see, I'm sure that this moderate line towards UDA supporters is the right one in view of the role as a safety valve. In my opinion, it would be unwise to dismiss a member of the UDA from the UDR unless he had committed a military offense. Otherwise there'd be widespread morale problems. And um, this official says, <laughs> He wishes he could say that membership of the UDA was not compatible with membership of the UDR and that we've no evidence that a UDR member is actively associated with them, but I fear it would be wrong to offer assurances on either point. Um, we thought it was interesting to note that extremist infiltration of, of the armed forces is, is, a, is an issue today. Um, 
you can see there's Tommy Robinson uh, with, with British troops. Um, the German armed forces have an issue with, with Nazis in their, in their ranks. UK soldiers, similarly, uh, and the Americans are trying to learn at the moment if they're willing to, how to uh, confront extremism within their own ranks. Um, I mean, it's very, I, I was watching to the uh, rats uh, mm. at the Capitol building and funny, it, it struck me along with then the later news a few days later um, of loyalists meeting with the NIO, etc. cetera, that uh, how little things have actually changed um, and that even a Western democracy like America on its own doorstep um, has problems with extremism that it has yet to face. And indeed, it had probably an American president that was fueling it. Yes, indeed. Um, and then similarly, we, you know, we have found evidence that, uh, you know, that, that weapons losses, we know this, we, we know this from the subversion of the UDO report, that weapons losses were phenomenal, uh, but that they were tolerated. Um, I'll show this again. Um, since the beginning of the current campaign, the best single source of weapons for Protestant extremist groups has been the UDR. Um, there's a phenomenal letter here that says, um, uh, during the period 17th to 24th of November 72, there were no thefts or loss of any arms reported by UDR units. So it was noteworthy enough that nothing went missing in one week to write a letter about it. In one week. Um, and intelligence reports indicating that there's some leakage of UDR ammunition. It's interesting that in the, in the American instance in 1998, the Department of Defense found similar issues with uh, infiltration that adult leaders of far-right extremist groups encourage young men and women to enlist in the military to gain access to weapons, military training, uh, and, and other, other things. And um, that's exactly what we found with uh, loyalist infiltration of the UDR. Um, um, in the in the book as well, and again, I thought this was was impressive because not only did you contextualize the formation of the UDR, because it didn't it wasn't formed in a vacuum. There was the conflict, of course. There was the Hunt report. There was the some would say traumatic loss for the community for the the unionist community of the B specials, uh, but. You also correctly position, well, I think correctly, other people may disagree, but I think correctly position the UDR in its wider context and draw the reader right back to yeomanry and to militia. Was the UDR any different? Um, we didn't go terribly far back. I have seen um, local historians referencing as far back as the Red Branch Knights to prove that there was a, there was a militia presence always in Ireland. Um, but certainly we went back as far as the 1800s to show that um, there was always a highly politicized and militarized force identified with the Protestant descendancy here. Mm. Uh, and when that came under threat, the Yeomanry Corps, uh, which was the predecessor, I think, of the of the B-Specials, they, they became embroiled in, in local struggles for dominance. Um, it's been described as a dangerous species of ally um, we have a letter from, from Robert Peel in 1815, if I can think of it. Uh, he was saying that while the yeomanry was unfit for its duties in maintaining order, he couldn't quite agree to get rid of them. Hmm. The yeomanry disappeared as a force uh, over the 19th century, um, but all the issues associated with it, we've got you know quotes that say things like admitting unattested men, uh, difficulties in establishing a force free from object objection, allowing arms to leak into the community and arming one section of a divided community uh, to act as a filter and compromise. It's very similar to the language used about the UDR and, uh, and the B-Specials indeed in, in the 20th century. Well, I mean, that leads us, uh, I mean, those analogies with the likes of the Yeomanry and the militia lead, lead me on to Another interesting question that I thought, I mean, this would be a, a question from the perspective of, say, our community, in that where did the UDR go wrong? Or in an ideal world, we know perhaps what they should have done and how they should have vetted people and how they should have been more equal and more reflective of the community. But realistically, during the conflict, as it was then, 
were these options open to the British Army? Um, I'm not sure that the ordinary, decent, honourable UDR man ever stood a chance because the UDR as designed was designed to, to go as wrong as it did, I think. It was, a, it was a colonial militia force. It had a very lax vetting procedure. It was the vetting procedure itself was, um, was you know, run roughshod over constantly. The RUC were falsifying records for XP specials because then we have all this evidence in the booklet. There was a plausible reason for the UDR upon its formation to be flooded with these specials, which was they needed to get up and running fast. But the very fact that they did flood the UDR, the new regiment, to, to, to remove it uh, with, with these specials meant it was gone wrong from the start. Um, in fact, county commandants of the, of the B specials became, initially became uh, the local commanders. Almost immediately, the British saw that this was a problem and tried to replace them with regular army command, commanders. Um, we have a quote, actually, I think it's from Potter, where he talks about they, they employed training majors from the regular army to, to watch their commanding officers well, if, they're in, if they were B-specials, to ensure that they were behaving not as B-special county commandants might have done, I think is the quote. Um, the decision to appoint regular army people wasn't popular. Um, we have Potter again. He talks about a county commandant who expressed his... Uh, it's almost a rage at being replaced. He talked about uh, his home and family had long been established in County Londonderry, yet his command was handed over to a man with no previous experience of Northern Ireland and in accordance with MOD policy, a Roman Catholic. Um, a couple of weeks after the first regular army CO took over command, he took over command of three UDR uh, on, in February 1971, a, a bomb was discovered uh, it was, it was detonated, actually close to his headquarters. Um, and it's thought, Potter, who's not unsympathetic at all to the UDR, he's an ex-UDR major, he says, thought to have been detonated by Protestant extremists. Um, I think it's clear that unionists wanted total control of it. Uh, we've, we've examples of letters and, you know, they, the, the, the I suppose the best way of putting it is the poisoning of the recruitment process. Mm. Um, um, and what I, what I was also thinking of as well, Michal, is that if we take the original design at face value in that they were wanting to create a regiment that was more reflective of the community with, say, for example, a third Roman Catholics. Mm -hmm. um, but then, of course, we know that those Roman Catholics who did join were then threatened and they were threatened by the IRA and they ended up some being killed in the early part. And that's whenever a lot of those recruits ended up losing and leaving yeah. uh, the UDR. Uh, so the, it had that extraneous and outside force as well as the internal force. And of course, then the vetting system, as you say as well. So that was uh, the, the, the question, whether or not was it, was it doomed to failure? Um. I think, yeah, well, it, 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 if the situation here had never been resolved, the UDR could, could possibly have endured and gone on. But because the situation in the north of Ireland had to be resolved, the UDR was exposed for the corrupting force that it was. Um, I don't think it could have, could have succeeded in being what it aspired to be. Mm -hmm. uh, it, you know, but it, what... what what loyalists and unionists wanted it to be was just um, to be specials with better weapons. Um, mm. And, and here, if, if, if one was a, a former member of the UDR or a family member whose mother and father are served in the UDR, would this be a book, UDR declassified, would this be a book that they could pick up and read and they too would learn some information that they too would have a greater understanding of their service or what their family went through, could members of that service community, could they uh, get something from this book as well? I hope they can. Um, the, 
the previous book I was involved with, the the impact of the parachute regiment, we were we we, we tried to be understanding of the situation that young soldiers found themselves in in uh, brutalizing recruitment and, and drilling conditions. We, we reflected their memoirs, we reflected their injuries, their deaths. You know, we tried to be fair to the kids that were brought into these situations to, to kill. In this context, um, we look right in any history of the UDR um, is gonna be fraught with danger. Um, for all everybody who served and for the majority in the Protestant community, they were ordinary men and women who felt they were defending their community. We talk about how some were heroes, some were victims. Um, and most were just family members who were constantly exposed to danger. We talk about the kind of the, the high wire act that people had to live to, to survive in the UDO. Um, but again, you know, the experience of the Catholic stroke nationalist Republican community could not have been more different. Um, the interactions with UDO patrols at roadblocks, whatever, were often just filled with fear and anger and for some a sense of powerlessness. Um, so, you know, there's, there's perspectives to reflect where the members of the UDR heroes and victims are, where they sectarian bullies and sometimes deadly colluders. The truth is that they were all of them. They were all of the above. Um, they were ordinary people in an extraordinary situation. And people are complicated. We say that the conflict here drove many people to do things that they would never have done in a normal society. Um, and to be fair to the UDR members, they were as much victims of that as we were. Now, as you know, um, I share the PFCs, the Pathway Lucan Centre's belief in the importance of archival research. It's the reason why Paper Trail was set up as well. Um, it, it, it offers us a greater understanding of the time. We know that archives aren't the whole story. We know sometimes that they can be written to tell lies and to back up a certain story, but uh, they gener generally do add to our knowledge, uh, whatever that knowledge is. It also tells us uh, a little bit about the context of our own history and what impacted ordinary people's lives. Um, what are the big policy documents within this book, UDR Declassified, that pushes our knowledge of history along, that tells us a little bit more, not only about the UDR, but also about the conflict at that time, that you know helps us understand a wee bit more about how the British state saw the UDR and saw the North of Ireland? I think some of the most important stuff we've found recently has been uh, documents that provide a better understanding of, of exactly how the policy of obscuring UDR members' identity was followed in, in, the, in, in the course of prosecutions. Um, just this year, we have found a document that proves that, um, um, I'm not going to name him, an, an unnamed member of, an, an associate of the Jackal, Robin Jackson, and uh, we discovered that it was a member of the UDR and that was obscured in the court cases. Of, it was just found by one of our colleagues among the declassified files. And it has added another name to that list of UDR personnel and service personnel that, that were part of the Glen Ann gang um, and will be added to the investigation into that. I think that's very important. Um, we have evidence of, of the Secretary of State's knowledge of the level of infiltration. We have evidence of the Prime Minister's knowledge of the level of, of infiltration and their comfort with that. Um, we have evidence of the prosecution service, the police, um, legal advisors and the NIO uh, um, colluding in when UDR members are arrested for various crimes and there have been a lot of them. We document some things, but um, the, the, the policy had been to hide the fact of their membership uh, and the anxieties that caused, I think, were, were, were fascinating and we exposed them a little. One of the more important things that we've discovered was to do with the legality of the call out of, of, call out of the UDR initially. 
This is a new finding, and I think it's one of the more important policy findings from, from our recent research. Um, we discovered that in May 1981, uh, the Permanent Secretary of the MOD was told that um, there was a question over whether UDR soldiers on duty were actually legally on duty because the formal call-out procedures hadn't been followed since the early 70s. Um, it's a complicated enough piece of work, um, but the implications are that there was a failure to call out the UDR on a permanent basis instead of a voluntary basis. Uh, and that has an implication for whether arrests, search operations, et cetera, carried out by members of the regiment under those, uh, under those uh, protocols were actually legal. So, do, do I smell a potential test case coming? Yeah, or? that's what we is, reckon. Is this the uh, difference between being arrested and being kidnapped then? This could be vast, you know. Um, it's, it's difficult to say at this remove and with only limited access to official documents. It's hard to judge the importance of the, of the advice, but it might be that an individual wanted to challenge a pre-1981 arrest and could follow this line of evidence. And it's interesting... I think to note that the MOD successfully kept the lid on this uh, mm -hmm. until we discovered the documents in the course of writing this book. So, um, I mean, that'll have an impact on a lot of people if, if, if it's as explosive as it could be. Mm. Now, I love all this discussion about archives and legacy archive research. Uh, PFC has been at the co-face of it for, for nearly a generation now, if not a generation. And, and the likes of myself and our organization have learned a lot from PFC and yourself. Um, but what's very interesting as well, and what you know adds another dimension to UDR declassified is of course, the very human stories and the fact that there are faces put on some of the great loss. And in some of these instances, it would be victims of UDR and UDR collusion with loyalist extremists. It would be those victims whose whose stories that you, you really do delve into. And I believe you've got a, a, a couple of key uh, slides that you can put up here at the moment, mm. which just tell the story of one gun that was stolen from a UDR base. Yeah. Because of collusion. Well, uh, people, some people may have seen this image before. And um, I just want to say, we have included a number of cases in this document, but haven't yet approached the families for permission to talk about them. Um, so I, I'd, be, I'd be anxious not to go into too much detail in individual cases. Um, I would uh, say this, that individual... I've things, seen this file before. I mean, yeah. All I've seen this, and I mean, this it's, it's quite exemplary in that it shows the impact of collusion at a barracks in the loss of guns yes. and the impact that even just one gun can have on dozens of people, not only through the loss of life and injury, but then the ramifications then for families thereafter sure. um, whose lives are, are wrecked. Um, um, well, this is a, a nine millimeter Sterling machine gun that was stolen from Glenan UDR base in May, 1971. Hmm. And my colleagues did a, did a great job in, in tracing the impact of that theft and that use of that weapon on so many families. Um, it's possibly not very clear there, um, but you oh, can see the chain of devastation in a number of attacks caused by people using that gun. Mm. Um, just one gun killed Dennis Mullen, um, a married father of two young children. Same gun was used to kill the three Reedy brothers. Uh, the John, Brian, and Anthony were were attacked while watching television at home. Um, the same gun was used to kill Trevor Brecknell, Patsy Donnelly, and Michael Donnelly at uh, Donnelly's filling station and bar in December 1975, and also used to kill the McCarneys, Fred McLaughlin, and Patsy McNeese. To a total of eleven people killed in eleven months, um, and there had been no investigation into that gun's disappearance. We we explore uh, in 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 some detail the sheer number of, of weapons losses and, and the tolerance of them, of, of it just going, you know, being walked off base and with some kind of set piece thefts uh, that were, you know, with heavy implications of collusion around them. But um, 
you know, we have a chapter on the on the the lethal impact of this one weapon. Um, but you know, as I say, the other chapters I I, I probably don't want to reveal yet uh, until we've spoken to the families ourselves. Mm. Well, we know the family names as well because those family members have been very active over the last forty odd years in campaigning. Yeah, right up until this present day, and and that shows you very physically for viewers how impactful that has been on those families. If those family members are still fighting for mm -hmm. for truth and justice, now. Legacy archive research is very difficult, and I know that better than anybody. It's okay looking at a book such as yours um, and thinking, oh, isn't it, uh, that author needs congratulated on the work that he or she has done. I know how much work has gone into that before that. Um, decades of work, not only your work, but also the PFC as well. Mm -hmm. uh, to put it into context for some people who don't necessarily uh, understand the, the level of work that goes into it. If you and the team from PFC were going over to the National Archives over in London, which costs a lot of money, and I know that you guys go over and stay overnight, and that you be doing it on your own time as well. Um, so it take, it's, it's quite vocational work in that. But there's around about 11 million files over in the National Archives in Kew. So if you took every single one of those files and stood them back to back, it would create a lane from Belfast down to Bray on the far side of Dublin. That's how many files there are. So your first job as a legacy archive researcher, before you've even put pen to paper and written one, one word, was to find that information. Mm -hmm. And whenever you go to find that information, we invariably find, unless we're very lucky, and unless there's been an element of human error, we may find that it's heavily redacted. We might find that it's closed. I know that the PFC, like ourselves, have numerous examples of having access to information in files and then those files being closed down behind them. Yeah. Uh, over in the likes of these archives, they have takedown teams. They've got reclassification panels whose job it is to ensure, if needs be, Files are taken back down again and reclassified mm -hmm. as closed. So other members of the public can't get to that information. Then, of course, we are forever facing the likes of the MOD or the PSNI and its predecessor, RUC, actively trying to stop us from getting information. They will use the Freedom of Information Act to try and stop us getting it. They mm -hmm. will use national security. The likes of health and safety and not naming people is no problem. We understand that completely. But it does seem for legacy archive researchers, whenever we do finally fight and get information from the likes of MOD or the police, that is more to do with national shame than it is to do with national security, um, even whenever names and, and addresses and personal details are taken out. Then, of course, there's the rather even more sinister fires and buckets in police headquarters yeah. or asbestos being found in ceilings. Uh, I think it was a member of the PFC, JFF, who phoned up to find out whether or not asbestos could be taken uh, from files and the files made safe. And of course that was the case as well. And even recently you had in February, 2018, if my memory serves me right, whole stores of UDR information going yeah. up in flames in one of the most heavily guarded and protected and secure installations in Western Europe, in Palace Barracks. And we were told at the time, don't be worrying, it's only pension details, it's, it's nothing to worry about. And it took uh, an FOI from Amnesty, if my memory serves me correct, and my apologies yeah, if, if right. I'm incorrect. Yeah. And that, but, I, but I think it was Amnesty who did a, an excellent FOI and asked a simple question, tell me what information has been lost there. And it turns out the information that has been lost could potentially be very important and very basic military logs which show where and when and who were out on operation in various uh, locations yeah. at various times uh, throughout the conflict. Absolutely essential information which has potentially been lost forever. So information today, as you well know, as everybody in the PFC knows, but just to put it in the context for, for people that might be viewing this, it seems to me is a new battlefield. 
Yeah. This is where the war is being waged now. The war is now being waged on information. So what can families do to try and protect that information, to try and retrieve it, to try and gather it for evidence in their own cases, like what you have done in UDR Declassified, but what can ordinary people uh, like ourselves, what can we do in this very uneven battle that we're facing? Very good point. You make very good points you make about about it all. It, it, uh, if we look at our at the experience of people in the Bally Murphy inquest or uh, the Kathleen Thompson uh, case, yeah. where there uh, you know there is deliberate obfuscation of where soldiers were, who they were. Um, there's social media campaigns to deny evidence, to deny testimony, uh, to try in the face of court rulings. You have the um, the military and the NIO themselves denying to comply with court rulings. Um, I think one of the things about this project, even you know, even up to this week, we're finding new things. We're, we're constantly pruning and probing through these mass of the paper and finding sometimes finding gems such as that uh, one on the on the on the call out ruling or call out protocol. Um, it's difficult work and it's difficult sometimes uh, you know I'm relatively new to this and uh, sometimes it's difficult for me to spot the relevance of something but uh, there are sharp eyes in our organization and sharp eyes belonging to yourself as well Kieran that can identify something that's being very very uh, explosive as very impactful um your question makes me think of the families of paul witters and julie livingston uh, they were two kids and they were killed in separate incidents by the rec in the british army they were killed with plastic bullets yeah. families have been told that files relating to their deaths have been sealed for decades that they living relatives are unlikely to see them in their lifetime. Um, we have tried, we've accompanied the families to meet uh, the Secretary of State. Um, we've met with, you know, blank refusal and out, like, outright lies about the ownership of these documents. Um, and we tried to kind of push things along with public campaigns. And I think what, what ordinary people can do is get behind those campaigns when they see them. Mm. Um, support the Bally Murphy families uh, during during this inquest. Support the families of any. We're going to see it again and again when soldiers are coming up against against serious charges that there'll be attempts to to muddy the water. Um, so I, I would say to families to get behind campaigns by ourselves, by yourself, by other organisations whenever they see them and. Uh, and add their names and their, their voices to calls for information to be released. Mm. Um, and just keep working, just keep digging. Um, a friend of mine, a friend of your, yours as well, I think, uh, once described our work as narrowing the permissible lies. And I love that line. I think I'm going to get it on a T-shirt or a mug or something. But that's, I think, that's I think what our work is. It's, it's, it's closing down the opportunities for the truth to be obscured. And we just keep digging. Um, leading on from some of that, what I find very useful in the book, and I mean, it's, it's what I would find in, in very well referenced books, but even from a family point of view, a campaigner point of view, and a legacy archive research point of view, is it's very well referenced. So you not only see the physical document in the book and the important mm -hmm. part in how it's written, but you then see on that same page, the file reference in the likes of the National Archives or down at the Public Records Office in Northern Ireland. Yeah. And I think that's important. Some people might be looking at that and going, well, those little numbers and letters down at the bottom, I don't understand what they mean. But whenever they start that first, first, whenever they break down the barriers and go into the likes of Prony or go over to the likes of Q, over to TNA, over to the National Archives, they will then have a reference point and yeah. they will have a catalogue serial number and they can begin that journey as well. And I mean, what I would tell people who we bring down to archives and PFC have brought down to archives as well is that family members do not, or family members would know their case better than anybody else. They know sure. better than academics, they know better than 
uh, charities like ourselves. They know it better than lawyers. They know it better than even the state. They know the intricacies of their own case and they know what's important and they have the patience and they have the passion as well. So what is important for me, from my family point of view, whenever reading a book like that, is that there are documents in there that might jump out at people mm -hmm. and they might be thinking about their own case and they be, might be thinking, well, if, if they have a log in there that shows when such and such was arrested, that means they might have a log in there to do with the arrest of somebody that was involved in my mum or daddy's uh, death or murder. Um, and there's a, a catalog reference number. So if ever I'm down a prony, I can look at that and see the, what information is in there. And I might be able to track back and track forward and get a specific date for the case that interests me. Mm. So, I mean, that's another key reason why I think a book like yours is important because it tells people um, the level of information that they will be able to get from public records, even though we know how difficult it is to get that information, even though we know the cards are heavily stacked against ordinary people finding that information and retrieving it because there's laws, uh, even though it's supposed to be open government, we know that those laws are designed to stop us from getting that information or that information has been deliberately kept away from uh, from those archives. We're, we're, we take pains to reference everything. And um, for that, for the reason yeah. that you said, but also to that we can stand over everything that we, we have evidence for everything that we say. Um, and one of the other key things I wanted to do was to, was to make, as you said, the documents very legible. And yeah. on a totally separate note, I'm, I'm a, my background is disability advocacy before I came into the PSE. Mm. And I think it's very important that when people are putting up images of files that they also supply the text that's um, yeah. that's going to be accessible to people who have, who have problems identifying the image. Uh, so we took pains to do that as well. I just wanted to put that in. Um, but I do yeah. agree with you that the, the accessibility of the documents is really important to individual family members to be able to see what we're talking about and not just believe us. <laughs> yeah. Um, which led me then on to the big question. I mean, you can't talk about the north of Ireland or Northern Ireland uh, without mentioning the word collusion. Now, collusion for me, it's a fluffy word. And the reason why it's a fluffy word, I'll tell you, is because of this. It means different things to different people. You can mm -hmm. speak to top judges and they'll tell you different reasons for it uh, and what it means. Uh, it's not on the statute book. And of course, therein lies the problem because lawyers can but are but antlers uh, for years in court, and we won't be anywhere near to what it actually means. Um, the first time, though, that I ever saw the word collusion written down within archives was in conjunction with the UDR and with loyalists. And it was written down many times in the early 70s, but it was written down by the British Army, mm -hmm. and it was written down in high-level meetings between the British Army, MOD, and uh, British civil servants, and high-up uh, ministers and uh, undersecretaries of state, etc. So high level meetings where they're discussing collusion. Yeah. All, long before that, it was ever within a nationalist or Republican lexicon. Uh, and, and many, many years before, it's the British state that is talking about collusion. Now, the PFC a few years ago found a very, very important British Army paper called... Um, subversion in the UDR. And I always thought that it was very interesting from a loyalist perspective where they would go, well, it wasn't really collusion. We were just highly successful at infiltrating the UDR. And this paper sort, this paper subversion in the UDR uh, goes some way uh, to look at that. But it specifically looks at, if my memory serves me right, 10 UDR, which would have been in North Belfast. And I don't know whether you know, but I'm from that area uh, of the New Lodge. Um, specifically around Thorndale, which would have backed onto the house with McMahons where they were murdered in the, mm -hmm. in the 20s. Um, but I live beside Gerwood Barracks. And of course, the, the roads in the shadow of Gerwood Barracks was called Murder Mail because of the amount of people uh, from my community that were killed uh, along its route. Now, do you think that's accidental? That... That's called Murder Mile, and there was so many people within my community that were murdered along there. 
and they're slap bang in the middle of it. We have Gerwood Barracks and we have 10 UDR mm. on the streets. Um, the word collusion, as you say, was, was used as early as 1972 in high level documents in the, among the British Army and the NIO. Um, I'll share a document there if I can. So um, that's some, some documents on weapons theft where collusion is strongly suspected. Collusion suspected by an unknown member of the unit or suspected that theft was planned with the collusion of someone else in the unit. We have a, a, you know, a scrawled note, an appalling list which lends colour to recent allegations of connivance. It's, uh, it could have been called connivance for the rest of their lives, but <laughs> the collusion stuck. Um, this memo here was for ministerial attention. Uh, where they talk about suspected collusion uh, twice in the term, in 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 terms of weapons thefts. Um, the ten UDR investigation actually happened in began in 1977. We have a number of documents. We, we have a chapter on it in the booklet, but it, 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 I think it's interesting to be able to say that again. They t they talk about how morale in the battalion was being affected. Um, there. There was massive infiltration of 10 UDR um, by serious, a serious amount of UVF people, um, including one member of the Shankill Butchers. So the army feared that 70 soldiers in 10 UDR were linked to the UVF in Belfast. Um, one of the charges was that UDR personnel were suspected of defrauding the UDR to the tune of yeah. £47,000 and redirecting that to the UVF. But also they, there was investigations that showed that UVF members were openly uh, frequenting and fraternizing uh, at the, at the Girdwood Barracks Mess and Social Club. Um, one of the things that was, that was very interesting about it was that the army was so concerned not to upset the members of 10 UDR, who at this stage they knew was, was massively infiltrated, that they were anxious to test their weapons for uh, evidence of, uh, you know, use in other in, in crimes, but they couldn't, they couldn't do it openly. So they they concocted a reason, which was uh, to take the weapons to a, a, a firing like a, a gun competition mm -hmm. uh, over in Bisley in England, uh, so that they are the UDR members would think, okay, we're fine, we're taking part in the game here, but their weapons were secretly being tested. There was a, a, a genuine fear of the UVF in that gang and the fear was justified and what it shows us is that subversion was still widespread by 1978 it wasn't just a creature of 72 and 73 when the subversion in the UDO report was, was written uh, and it also shows that the initial estimates contained in that subversion document were you know of, of penetration by Loyalist extremists was far lower than the fact was, you know. So they, they said, uh, let me see, they said uh, in 1975, they said that a small number, around 200 extremists, are spread between the 11 battalions of the UDR, uh, thought to have connections, however slight, with extremist organizations. Well, what 1978 showed was that at least 70 members of one battalion had these links. Um, and despite concerns of, of what they call serious penetration of the battalion by the UVF, which included a member of the Shankill Butchers up around your neck of the woods, the information was withheld from the public and parliament um, after a deliberate decision, a deliberate policy decision was taken. Um, we, and we provide all that evidence in the, in the book. Excuse me. And as we know, that uh, 10 UDR went on to do even more terrible things in the 1980s. And if my memory serves me right from previous PFC research as well. Is my, is my memory correct whenever I remember that 10 UDR was the only battalion that was allowed to request to operate in other battalion areas? That's right. Um, we, we have the document that, that allows them uh, allows them to volunteer for service in other in other counties. Um, so, so, you no have, so we have, in Murder Mile, we have uh, 10 UDR, which the files in 73 
estimate between five to 15% have been, are, are members of loyalist extremist groups as well. And yet they're able to volunteer to operate in other battalion areas across the North, mm -hmm. even though they've been heavily infiltrated. Yeah. Uh, it's, no chilling. It's, it's chilling to, to know that, it's, you know, that 10 to 15% estimate, that's one in seven, say. So yeah. in a mess hall, one of the people around you is a, is a UVF person. And if, and if you didn't know it, then the guy beside you did. Um, so, you know, there was, there was, so there was a uh, subversion penetration, whatever you want to call it, but there was certainly tolerance of it as well. Mm. Uh, there, there, there's evidence of people being rooted out, and you know, if people went too far, they were, you know, they were, they were, they were found out and thrown out. But you know, the, the very the sheer number of of UD, UDR people who were commit who were convicted of crimes and had their identities as UDR personnel suppressed, mm. uh, and those. We have evidence that shows the uh, MOD was having difficulty in even compiling the numbers because so many of the crimes were what they called um, domestic crimes, I think is the term they used. Like the, the incidence of criminality within the UDR far exceeded the, uh, the you know, the estimate that there's the, the correct figure for a normal population or indeed for the police or indeed for the rest of the British Army. Yeah, which, I mean, I think we covered a lot of bases there and we've proper we've given proper heed to how different members of the community would have viewed uh udr um not only service people but members of my community as well who lived under the shadow of uh, 10 udr but some people may have thought that the udr was designed to funnel those local concerns and the vast majority of uh, members did join um, to vent those concerns that they had for their local community and the country. Um, others may say that as far as the criminality of UDR members was concerned that we now know from UDR declassified were hidden from the public domain and even from the court, may say that it's a few bad apples and we hear that argument being made. But others for example, within the Republican community, may say that elements of the Ulster Defence Regiment and Loyalist extremism were run as deniable British military intelligence counter gangs, mm -hmm. a la low intensity operations by our good friend General Sir Frank Kitson. Where do you sit after all of this research? How far up the ladder did this go? Ah. Uh. There's certainly evidence that as, as, as far up as the Prime Minister knew about the, the level of penetration, whatever else you can say about whether they, they, they knew how they were being directed, um, we certainly have evidence that um, the, the prosecution service, the police, the NIO, the Ministry of Defence colluded, as I said before, in, in obscuring the, the fact of UDR membership when, when somebody came up against the courts. Um, one fascinating one, I'll share this document, came to light uh, when PFC staffers found interview documents uh, surrounding this uh, a man who killed a Catholic. Turned out in the interview that he had asked the police that were interviewing him, he asked, where am I, where am I headed for next? Crumlin mm -hmm. Road Jail, they said. And he said, oh, that'll be interesting. The shoe will be on the other foot. Yeah. And it was only through following that comment that our colleagues were able to find that he had worked in the prison service. And then subsequently we found out that he was a UDR person. Um, so the efforts to obscure all of this were fascinating. Um, there's another document here uh, that's worth looking at where you can see at the top the Secretary of State's office are aware of it. Um, it comes from the Law and Order Division. This is in 1987. Mm. And there was a serving member of the UDR arrested yesterday for his part in the armed robbery of a building society. He was a part-time member of C Company in 7-10 UDR since 1986. He held up the bank, demanded cash, and forced an assistant to write a check, which they took to a nearby bank to cash. The police arrested the pair as they left the bank. He later admitted taking part in seven separate armed robberies. 
Now, that's fascinating, the level of ineptitude at robbing a bank and getting a check written for yourself. But uh, what's more interesting, I think, is that um, G.W. Davies of the Law and Order Division says that McGuinness resigned from the UDR this morning before being charged, and I understand that the police will not be referring to his membership of the security forces. Um, that level of collusion was commonplace. Um, mm. And even our friend Ryder comments on uh, the, the, the number of instances of this happening. So, yeah. Um, yeah, I think it was, it was policy to use the UDR for, as you say, you know, plausible deniability to do the things perhaps that they didn't want evidence of themselves doing. Um, but more kind of obviously what we can see is that, uh, you know, that, that they were, they were, they were covering up when somebody was caught who they were. And, and I think somebody made a very good point. Imagine in any other jurisdiction, uh, someone was up in court, say for example, invading US Congress. Mm. And it was hidden from court that it was a state trooper. Yeah. But this was policy, you know, it was colluded in by the criminal justice system. And another example then is the, uh, the example I told you earlier about the, the, the figure connected to the jackal in the Glenan gang. And uh, that's very significant evidence. His, uh, there was a weapons hall found at his home, significant weapons hall, and he was a UDR officer. And that, that fact was, was only discovered this year through the diligent and hard work of our colleagues combing their way through those pieces of paper. Yeah, yeah. And I mean, do you think that um, the British Secretary of State for Northern Ireland would like British soldiers who have a uh, dual membership of right-wing extremist groups walking about Great Yarmouth, where he's MP? We could certainly ask him. <laughs> well, Michal, thank you very much for, for taking the time to sit with me today. I could probably go on for a lot longer, but... Um, I bore enough people in my own family, <laughs> many people on YouTube. So tell me, when are you releasing this uh, great work? Well, we hope to release a, 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 a PDF version or, you know, a kind of a, an e-book reader version around the anniversary. So around the 1st of April. Um, and then we hope to have an in-your-hands copy ready for, say, the end of August, the start of September of this year. And the difficulty I mean, is that it keeps growing. Just, but before we go any further, I, I should remind anybody that's watching this that April the 1st isn't April Fool's Day because <laughs> of the book. It's because April April Fool's Day was whenever the UDR was actually set up in 1970, wasn't it? Yeah, pure coincidence. <laughs> just in the off chance other people were drawing analogies there. It was, it was just to <laughs> recognise an anniversary that's already there. Um well, congratulations. It's a fantastic piece of work and it's going to be a great reference, not only for the likes of myself, but I know it's going to be a great reference for, for people. And I do hope that um, ex-service men and women would pick it up and might mm. uh, find out a little bit about uh, what the British state thought about the Ulster Defence Regiment whenever they were serving and family members as well might learn a wee bit as well. In the meantime, anybody that's watching this can follow the rest of the Bloody Sunday 49 mm. events. And they can see the Museum of Free Dairies YouTube channel and also the Path Finucane Centre's own YouTube channel uh, for more on Bloody Sunday 49. And if anybody is on social media, where you'll normally find me if I'm not working, uh, you can type in hashtag Bloody Sunday 49. Uh, um, what else will people see on the PST YouTube channel, Miho? Uh, we launched the YouTube channel just at the, was it was at the end of last year or the start of this year. Anyway, we compiled all our campaign films onto, uh, on, onto the one site so that people can access them. Um, and the most recent one was of the voice of the family members calling for the Secretary of State to move, you know, progressively and swiftly now on, on legacy. So um, that'll keep growing as we make more campaign films. Um, so, yeah, I'd recommend Pat Manuka Centre YouTube. Uh, so our good our good friend Brandon Lewis then um, can go online and <laughs> check out YouTube at PFC and and hear those voices. Um, that's a battle in itself and probably another interview for another day. So it right. is me, Hall. 
Um, thank you very much for your time. Thank you very much, as far as I'm concerned, to the Pathanookan Centre and Justice for the Forgotten for giving me this opportunity. Thank you yourself for talking to me as well. I hope it hasn't been too um, it's too strenuous for you. I've enjoyed it thoroughly because I, I enjoyed reading the book and I, I think it's going to be very useful for the likes of myself and for our families um, in future years. And of course, thank you very much to the Bloody Sunday families uh, on yet another anniversary, 49 years. Justice delayed really is justice denied, but the Bloody Sunday families continue to be great inspirations uh, to all of us and, and a great inspiration to me uh, mm -hmm. as a campaigner and great inspiration to all the McGurk's Bar family and everybody up in Belfast as well. We look to the Bloody Sunday families and, and see their dignity and it teaches us how we should wage our campaigns as well. And of course, thank you very much to all the viewers who took time to watch this. Uh, you can pick up any questions with us online on social media. Thank you very much. Thank you.